Welcome to the Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. If you're looking to get more out of your Shenandoah Valley experience, then this is the podcast for you. You'll meet interesting people, musicians, and comedians that perform here and find out more about what you can do and see. Whether you live here or plan to visit, listen to explore what makes our unique slice of heaven. Now here's your host, Don Davis Womack. Hello, Laughers. Tune in today for a focused discussion on healthy relationships and restoring connections with our guest, Randy Hook. Randy is a licensed clinical social worker with extensive training in dialectical behavioral therapy and emotionally focused therapy. As a certified prevention relationship enhancement program instructor, Randy brings a wealth of expertise to our discussion. He believes deeply in the power of hope, healing, and possibility. Beyond his professional credentials, Randy is also a devoted husband to Kim and a loving father to their two boys, Jackson and Sawyer. Randy's passion extends beyond his work. He is an avid sports fan, enjoys playing golf, and finds solace in exploring his faith. Through his services, he aims to guide individuals through their life's challenges, fostering personal growth and uncovering their true self. Today, we delve into Randy's insights, drawing on his experience and wisdom to provide valuable perspectives on building and restoring meaningful relationships. Welcome to the show, Randy. It's great to have you on today. I'm excited to be here, Dawn. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here, too. I noticed in addition to your credentials, I'm looking at your desk over here, and you are also the best mental health professional in 2022 here in the Valley, it looks like. Well, thank you very much. I don't know how true that is, but I <laughs> sure appreciate everybody that uh, that decided to vote for me. It was very humbling and uh, I do appreciate it. Yeah, we are, Laughers, we are in his office, which is very zen, if I may say. I hope so. Yeah, it's very peaceful. I'm going for the warmth, right? Yeah. Safety. Yep, that's what yeah. it's all about. I love it. And I'm so excited to get into this with yeah. you today, because when we spoke on the phone mm-hmm. to schedule this interview, you talked about how much you love talking about this stuff. I do. Yeah. And you shared some sad stories as well as some hopeful ones. Right. And and how people go about their journey of healing. Mm-hmm. And I really can't wait because your expertise are going to provide so much to our uh, laughers because relationships are so important. We all have them. Absolutely. And, you know, and young, old, regardless of ethnicity, religion, uh, sexual orientation, at mm-hmm. the end of the day, it's about relationships you mm-hmm. know, and the quality of the relationships that we have in our life. And it's not something that's, that's talked about near enough. Um, I mentioned to you before that, you know, I teach a class at JMU. And when I get my evaluations back, one of the things that they, that they really cite is they, they like my real world examples of what makes relationships work Mm -hmm. and what doesn't because they're young people. Right. Mm -hmm. And as I've always said, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And that extends into adulthood many times that I see many marriages. um, And I don't just do marriage work. I do relationship work. So you don't have to be married to come see me, but I see lots of people that have just never done research into Mm -hmm. what makes a relationship thrive, you know? And that's sad. It's sad. Yeah. I think um, as I've been on my own mental health journey Mm -hmm. in the last few years, I I think, and I also have been reading this, we're coming a long way in therapy. Absolutely. From whence we came over 30 years ago. There's been a lot of development. Absolutely. And and just generational. Yeah. Um, Kids, I think, young people, I shouldn't say kids, Young people are finding it uh, more acceptable, I think, yes. to, 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 to get help, to find mm-hmm. a counselor. Um, and for any, any of the listeners, if you don't know how to find somebody, you know, I'm happy to help. Um, and the key is really finding somebody that is the proper fit for you, that's going to mm-hmm. make you feel comfortable. Whenever I meet with a client for the first time, I always say, I'm happy to work with you. I want to work with you. But this, if this isn't a good fit, then I'll help to find you the right fit. They may want a woman. They want somebody, may want somebody who's a little bit older or younger, mm-hmm. or they get intimidated by my gray, gray beard. Or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's just important to find your good fit. Yeah, I think so too. Hey, Lappers, Tisha here. You know what goes great with this podcast? 
free popsters gourmet popcorn. We're so excited to sponsor this podcast, highlighting some of the most wonderful people in the Shenandoah Valley. To show our love for you, Laughers, we're giving you 15% off today at prepopsters.com. That's P-R-E-P-O-P-S-T-E-R-O-U-S dot com. Use promo code LAUGH15. Yeah, there was a different uh, attitude about it, perception yeah, of stigma. mental health stigma yeah, for real. for a very long time mm-hmm. in history. Absolutely. So our grandparents didn't generation, talk about it. exactly. If something was difficult, you just didn't talk about it. Period. Yep. Yep. It's just and and seeing people have that, it's that pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. Mm-hmm. Like I get that, you know. You know, your son was an athlete. My kids were athletes, and I get it on a field. You know, buck up dig in, but in relationships, it, mm-hmm. it can be very destructive to take that type of attitude. Mm. Like too many couples, when you watch them argue, they're, they're not arguing to understand the other person. They're arguing to be heard, right? That's right. To and then, seen. And, and what I tell people is one of the hardest things to do when you are in conflict with your partner is to turn off that inner lawyer, right? Mm. The, the, the one that's ready to give the rebuttal. Right. And to learn how to be fully present to your partner when I'm teaching people how to talk to one another, as simple as that sounds, sometimes you have to do that. They find it very hard to turn that, you know, that that brain off that's constantly wanting to get in or in some cases, you know, talking about athletics to win the argument. Mm -hmm. If you ever go into an argument trying to win it, it's the wrong approach. I agree with that. And we're going to get into this. But before we, we get into your background, I just want to comment on what you just said. Uh, going through therapy and my husband and I have gone through some of our some of it ourselves. That's great. Yeah. And oftentimes what you're arguing about is not what you're arguing about. Amen. And being able to identify that. Mm-hmm. So we have a memory. We, we won't be sharing that detail today, but, <laughs> right. but you know, I remember looking at my husband, Chris and go, you know, cause it was, he didn't get cornbread Uh-oh. when I asked him to take out and he came home without the cornbread. Can't do that. <laughs> and there was a conflict mm-hmm. and I, to get through that, that noise, mm-hmm. I looked at him directly and I was, cause we, it was becoming about the cornbread. Absolutely. And I looked at him and I said, this is not about the cornbread. <laughs> no. When it's funny you bring that up because yeah. what I often see and I tell couples that when you're spinning your wheels in an argument yeah. and you can't get to the bottom of it, you're right. probably not arguing about the right thing. There's okay. usually a deeper issue there. And so we have to whittle it down to kind of figure out why are we arguing about, you know, when you had kids, you know, why are we arguing about the changing or, right. or who didn't get the diapers or, and, and we're doing it at two o'clock in the morning when we're both tired. Like there's usually deeper issues going on when you're spinning those wheels and you don't seem to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. But it's really scary for many people to go there um, because that requires vulnerability. Yes. And I'm, when I've talked to groups or classes or workshops, I've, I've always asked the question, I'll say, who here likes to be vulnerable? And never once, not shocking. The ne- whole class ne- isn't raising nope, their hand? Nope. Never what once a surprise. ever. You're right. Right. Because right? who wants to do that? Right. So this is the way I, I, I kind of approach it. When the boys were little, um, if they fell down and skinned their arm, right? Um, and I go over and they're crying and I'm saying, let me see it. They didn't immediately just extend the arm, right? Mm. They hide it and they go, oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. And, and you're going, let me see it. Let me see it. And they're going, no, no, no. Well, why? Because they know intuitively that if dad sees it, we're going to go inside and we're going to clean it and we're going to clean it. And then we're going to put the peroxide on it and that's going to make it hurt even worse. Okay, Mm -hmm. but 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 the reality is what if I don't do that, it's going to get worse. It's going to get infected. Okay, emotional pain is no different. Nobody Mm -hmm. wants to expose it. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants really to go there. But we know that we have to go there and heal those old wounds Mm -hmm. to be able to connect with each other. And when it comes to relationships, please, if your listeners want to remember anything from today, it is all about connection. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. 
I love it. And we call our listeners laughers just so you're clued in. Okay, laughers. We, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right. I'll try to remember laughers. <laughs> I love it. Well, you're very passionate about this. Very. So, I, yes, I would love if you could start with sharing a little bit more about your journey and what led you to become a licensed clinical social worker mm-hmm. with a focus on relationship enhancement. Yeah. Um, I told people or I tell people that, you know, I knew about the age of 16 that I wanted to be one of three things. I wanted to be the next shortstop for the Atlanta Braves. Nice. And that did not work out, obviously. No. Um, or I wanted to be the next drummer for Motley Crue. Um <laughs> Because I was playing I in a band it. at the time. Okay. Um, that didn't work out either. Right. Or I wanted to be a therapist. You knew at 16. I did. It's, it's really, and that's strange, admittedly. Yeah. It's strange. I, the way I described it to people is it, people seem to feel comfortable talking to me about their problems. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what that was. Um, male and female alike, you know, you know, would just come and talk to me and they would, you know, trust me with their feelings. And I thought to myself, you know, this feels good to be there for somebody mm-hmm. with somebody and walk with them on the journey. And I thought I can do this for a living. Like really? And once that hit me, I was like, and I never wavered. I, I never really, I had a panic attack in grad school when I had a really bad day. And I was like, I don't know that I can do this. And mm-hmm. I freaked out. I totally freaked out because I never thought about doing anything else. And to this day, I've been doing it for over 25 years and I, there's nothing else I want to do. Wow. It's an incredible, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough job in many right. ways, emotionally, spiritually, even physically sometimes. But the reward that you get in being able to walk with people, it's just, it's beautiful. It's mm-hmm. beautiful and humbling. So more your journey into this mm-hmm. was you felt a calling to do it rather than circumstances mm-hmm. in your home life or yeah. some tragedy or trauma or something. No, I would say that's, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty accurate. You have gone on to get extensive training mm-hmm. as you got prepared for this career in dialectical behavioral therapy and emotionally focused therapy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, for those of us that are not familiar with these types of therapies, mm-hmm. this is completely new terms to them. Sure. Can you tell us more about these types of therapies and what is the difference between them? Sure. DBT, well, just under the dialectical behavioral therapy, that I've used that more in individual work and group mm-hmm. work than I have in, in working with couples. But there are some principles that apply um, regardless. Let me give you an example of one that quite often. Um, and it's, it, it's called developing a wise mind. And it uses the premise that, that all of us have a emotional mind, like mm-hmm. an emotional self. And we also have a rational self. Mm-hmm. Well, the synthesis of those two, the joining of those two, that's the place of wisdom. And we call that wise mind. Now, I'm a super, super, no, actually, I'm just the opposite, super, super emotional person, always have been. Ask my mom, you ask my dad, I've always been emotional. Yeah. Yes. I asked her one time, I said, what's, I said, we've been married over 20 years. What's something that surprises you about me after all this time? She goes, yeah, you cry a lot. And I was like, I do, you know, I cry at commercials for God's sake, you know, I mean, I like, like the, the Christmas commercial with the, with the Pampers where the babies are like sleeping and they're singing silent night in the background. I cry every <laughs> That's time. That's it. You're yeah. up. It's a boy. But okay. anyway, so I will ask my clients that I will teach this concept. It's very simple. Yeah. But when they're arguing, you know, I will ask them if you just slip into wise mind for a second and try to restate what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And if you try to get to the heart of the matter, that what would that sound? And it's amazing to me that just slowing things down, mm, we mm-hmm. call it, we call it pacing in therapy, right? Just pacing things so that people can get out of their head and into this. And I'm pointing to my chest because I, I point to the chest as kind of the center of us, right? Mm-hmm. Let's get to that place of wisdom. And then let's have discussions about what we're wanting, what we're needing from one another in relationship. I hope that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. So then there's the emotionally focused therapy. And what Mm -hmm. is that about? Um, That's specifically in doing work with couples. Um, I did an externship um, and it's based on the work by Dr. Sue Johnson, um, who wrote a book called Hold Me Tight. 
um, and it's basically focuses on attachment. Mm. Um, and, and, and it's vitally important for people to understand what your attachment style is because it has such a big influence on how we interact. Like if you understand that you have what's called an anxious, um, avoidant type of attachment style, when, when people learn that they'll go, so that's why I act the way I act. That's why if my boyfriend, if we're watching a movie and we're 15 minutes into it and he hasn't said anything, I'm going to look up and say, do you still love me? Mm -hmm. Right. There's no evidence that he doesn't, but some of us are just really anxious and we need that reassurance more. Um, And that's regardless of whether you're male, female, hetero or not, you know, we all need that sense of security. Um, I did a interview with Bob Corso before he retired and off the air. He said, he said, what really is it that, that couples are seeking? And I said, it's not really crazy, Bob. I said, they're seeking safety, Mm -hmm. security, and connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. And with regard to EFT, EFT is always trying to get to the heart of the matter, right? Always trying to get to where's the root cause of this. As I mentioned earlier, when we're spinning our wheels, we may be arguing about, you know, where we're going for the holidays, but we might be arguing about commitment. We might be arguing about what's most important to us, right? Mm -hmm. And having those hard conversations for couples is, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but it's it's so vital to the, the relational health to be able to have those hard conversations. That's why I'm so passionate. I love that. There's so much rich information in there, including the attachment style. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about that a Mm -hmm. little bit more. There's the anxious in general, three Mm -hmm. types, but you can have Mm -hmm. a blend. Mm -hmm. There's Mm -hmm. the anxious attachment style. There's avoidant. Avoidant attachment style. and Secure. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, you can't necessarily, and there's some argument this, but you can't really change your attachment style. That's what, Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, you can become more secure being a person with an anxious attachment style, right? I did not know like that. You can work through it, but I don't know that you, it's not like you graduate to, to secure attachment. Um, at least my understanding of it is, but, okay. but we should always be working towards what are the barriers? What are the things that are keeping me from feeling secure in my relationship? Those should always be an conversation but some people are just they're kind of born that way that's their temperament style um you could probably see it when they were in childhood um if they have adverse childhood experiences mm-hmm. aces we call them um then it, it can make it even more complicated which is why going back to what i was saying before the willingness to go back and heal old wounds so that we can be better prepared for relationships down the road think mm-hmm. about it this way um I use the example where I'll stand up sometimes and I'll say, we all have baggage, right? Mm -hmm. And if I'm holding a suitcase in my left hand and a suitcase in my right hand and you have yours and you're holding them in your hands and and you and I want to embrace and be Mm -hmm. together and be intimate in that way, we can't do that until we unpack that baggage, right? So we've got, we got to put those bags on the ground, unpack them so that we can be better capable of embracing that person in the way that would be most healthy for both of us. Mm. And our research tells us that, you know, getting in a relationship to really find yourself is not the healthiest. Usually the healthiest relationships are with people who have um, a a, a differentiated self that is similar, right? What do you mean by that? That that there's, so here's the best way for me to say it. Mm -hmm. I would be devastated if something happened to Kim. Mm -hmm. She's the love of my life. Um, That's evident. Oh, I just, (laughs) I just adore her. And if something happened to her, I would be absolutely devastated, but I'm still Randy. I'm still a dad. I'm still a son. Um, I'm still a friend, a brother, a a brother, a child of God in my worldview. I'm still all of those things, right? A therapist, right? I want to continue to do that. Um, And she has a similar sense of herself. It's one of the things that I love about her. You know, we need each other. Because we're married and we chose to, to take this path. And I have no problem saying that, by the way. Um, I tell people I need the crap out of Kim. I do. <laughs> you know, and I'm okay to say it. And yeah. people, are, people see that as dependence. It's not mm-hmm. dependence. That's just what healthy relationships look like. I want to need my partner. One of the saddest things I hear is when I'll ask somebody in here in this office, I'll say, tell me what, is, what it is that you need the most from your partner. 
And then I'll hear somebody sometimes say, I, I don't really need much of anything. And then you'll see the partner just shrink mm. because they're thinking to themselves, this is the problem. This person doesn't. Need me. And do they even want me? Okay. Those are the couples that attend. I think well, I said this off air. Those are the couples that I tend to say you should have been here 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago. The key to it is don't wait. So laughers, hear that, please. Mm -hmm. Don't wait, whether it's a mental health issue or depression or anxiety, or it's, you know, needing work on your relationship. Don't wait. Go out and find somebody that's going to fit for you. I like that. And I think if I'm hearing you right, the idea, well, we're either prone to be more anxious or avoidant. Mm -hmm. But we can work toward feeling secure in a relationship Absolutely. with each other mm -hmm. if we understand that about ourselves. It's almost like a language. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, everybody's heard about the, you know, the five love languages. Mm -hmm. I read an article on that. Um, I think it, or maybe it was on NPR. I can't remember um, where it was saying there's not a whole lot of research to back up the five love languages. And I get that. understand. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're still important concepts mm -hmm. because it, it teaches people that there are specific ways that people want to be loved and mm -hmm. truly desire to be loved. So I think there's still value, whether there's, you know, the concrete research behind it. I still think I still think discussions around how we love each other and what we need through that is super important. Mm. And if a couple has gotten to a place where they don't need anything, then they've Kind of, they've detached. Yes. I call it the drift. You know, the drift. they start to, you know, if I'm, I'm holding up my two hands, like, so my hands are going farther and farther apart. I see that so often um, within uh, a, another uh, a theory that I've, that I've looked at, you know, they talk about, um, it's called relational erosion, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you imagine you get like a ding in your truck. You know, mm -hmm. initially you're like, oh, it's just a little ding. It's not, not a big deal. But after a while it starts to erode. And then a year or two later, you're like, man, that's really got bad. Yeah. Right. And same thing with relationships. If we're not addressing it, if we're just drifting away, then the presence, we know this from research, then the presence of the other person is, is you see more distress rather than mm -hmm. comfort and security. Right. And mm -hmm. so then you're going to do what? You're going to avoid them. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you don't, you don't, you no longer see them as a person that provides you with, with, again, with comfort, with safety, with security, with pleasure. And so you just don't, you just don't. Yeah. Wow. With your certification as a prep instructor, mm -hmm. that's the prevention relationship enhancement program. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the key principles of that program and its impact on couples? Sure. Probably the most helpful concepts and easiest to understand are what they call the, the communication danger signs. Okay. Oh, that's a new term for me too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so what you, and, and any couple can do this and I would encourage, you know, all the laughers to write these down um, and, and sit down with your partner if you're brave enough to do it. <laughs> right. And see where you land on these. So the okay. first one is invalidation. Okay. And what I tell people is that in my experience, no research behind this, just my experience is that continued invalidation in, in a relationship is, is going to destroy it. Um, mm. And invalidation can be subtle. Like, you know, Kim wanted to get away when we had our 10th anniversary. Like I went to her and I said, we could, let's take, let's take a big trip somewhere. And Kim's traveled the world. You yeah. know, she's lived in Italy. You know, I studied abroad as well. I thought she'd say something like that. Right. Right. So I go up to her and I was like, have you decided where you want to go? And she said, I do. And I said, where? And she goes, I want to go to Vegas. <laughs> All right. And, and I went, huh? <laughs> like I said, I mean, my face was like, what? And she was, she was like, you don't like that idea. And I was like, no, I just, it, it, it's taken me aback. I did right, not surprise you. Yes, you weren't I, expecting that. Yes. I said, Vegas is fine. I just did not think you were going to say it. So again, that's a subtle invalidation. Okay. Mm. But then there are bigger invalidations when, when, when people just say things like you're crazy, right. Or, mm. you know, you're overreacting. Um, or I don't think that's a very big deal. 
Okay. We want to be able to validate our client or well, our clients for sure, but our partners, <laughs> right. we want to be able to validate their feelings in the space and we don't necessarily need to agree with it. Okay. Mm. That's the key. We don't, we can agree to disagree, but we need to acknowledge each other's feelings and beliefs about what it, whatever it is that we're talking. Another one of the danger signs um, would be escalation. Mm. Yeah. And those couples can be very challenging. I call them professional escalators. Like, like <laughs> okay. they just get after each other and the emotional barometer. Oh, the quick ramp up. Yes. It just quickly ramps up. They start yeah. to throw barbs at each other. They start right. to, they get defensive and offensive at the same time, which is a bad combination. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so helping them to regulate that emotion. You're never going to hear me say, don't be emotional in an argument. That's just silly to me. As mm-hmm. I told you before that I'm a super emotional poor person. I don't know how to have a conflictual discussion with somebody without having deep feelings. Mm-hmm. But it is my responsibility to regulate those feelings so that I can stay present in the moment. And that's what we try to teach couples to do, to stay present. in the moment. And again, trying to get to the heart of the matter rather than just arguing about stuff. Um, another one is um, avoidance and withdrawal. Mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. heteronormative men are really good at that. Okay. Really good at it. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than facing it, rather than talking about it, just going out in the shop, going for a drive, going out to the golf course, doing something like it's easier, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't solve anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at, you know, what are the barriers that are keeping you from staying in this conflictual state or having this difficult conversation Because we want to get to a place where we have at least some resolution to it. Avoidance and withdrawal doesn't lead to anything good. John Gottman talks about couples during conflict do one of three things. They turn away. Mm -hmm. They turn against, which is fight. Mm -hmm. Or they turn towards, right? And guess which one's the hardest? Turn towards. Amen. Right? Because that, remember from before, that's where the vulnerability is, Mm -hmm. right? When people come into this office and... It's, it's amazing how quickly often they will get to a place of tears, right? Mm. What do they say? What do most people say after they start crying? I don't know. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Most people, think about it. Yeah. Think about it. Most people, when they begin to cry, are going to apologize. And that saddens mm. me. You know what I mean? That saddens me. I, I try, Because what I tell people is if the tears are there, they're there for a reason. And I always say to my clients, I say the same thing. When I see tears in my clients, whether it's with working with a couple or an individual, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm noticing some emotion come up. I wonder if you could lean into that. And if those tears had words, what would they be saying? right? Now? That's so good. Right? Yeah. Like, what would they be saying? Right? Now? And when you can get to that tender space, and especially with couples, because now you're getting to work. Okay. You're getting to the heart of the matter because they're allowing themselves to feel that emotion. That's where healing occurs. Hmm. The last of the communication danger signs um, is negative interpretation. Um, we all know that person, right? So that <laughs> if they can interpret something negatively, they're going to interpret it. Negative Nancy's. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so like, the, the, the example that I use, let's say I, uh, I'm going to embarrass Kim here a little bit because she never notices Dawn when I get a haircut. She doesn't notice. She doesn't. She never noticed. Well, you do keep it pretty short like that right. all the time she, for right. as long as I've known you. Yes. And she, she just okay, does. Okay. In fairness to Kim. Right. <laughs> but like if I came home after my haircut right. and she goes, Oh, I love your haircut. And I go, you didn't like how I had it before. That's a negative interpretation. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Just very, again, subtle. But when you, when couples are in the drift, right. Right. That any, uh, the, the way you walk in the door, the look that you have on your face, the tone that you have in your voice, the energy that you carry with yourself mm-hmm. will often be negatively interpreted when you're, feeling disconnected. I tell people all the time that when Kim and I are bickering, um, and we do because we're human, mm-hmm. when, when we're just kind of being short with each other, um, I would almost guarantee you it's because we're not feeling connected. Mm. And so then mm-hmm. that needs to lead to a discussion about what does connection look like then for you? And when I'm assessing couples, this goes, this isn't a, this isn't from a, a specific theory. This is just something that, that I do with my couples. And we assess for four, what I call the four pillars of connection. The first is emotional. How emotionally connected, how emotionally safe, 
How emotionally fed do I feel by my partner? And then I'm going to ask them to give me a number on a scale of one to 10. I'll say that 10 means, oh my gosh, my, I am so emotionally safe. I'm so emotionally fed. I'm so emotionally connected. Couldn't be better. One, I don't feel emotionally connected, understood, safe at all. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's danger zone. Certainly it's danger zone. The second one I call social intellectual. We like to do things together. We like to have fun. Right. Mm-hmm. We like to laugh. That's Absolutely. Everybody here. I everybody, believe in that. All the laughter. Like to laugh. <laughs> right. That we do. Yeah. Um, like this weekend, Kim and I, we're, we're going up to D.C. and we're going to the Kennedy Center and we're going to see the National Symphony Orchestra and have a date. Night, oh, right? that's lovely. Yeah. And that will be just about her and I connecting. Right. And I tell people that the quality time um, that, that is built for connection needs to be a, a, a priority and not a luxury. Okay. For too many couples, it's a luxury. Now, not everybody can just take off and go to the Kennedy Center and see the National Symphony Orchestra. It's not about that. It's about, you know, putting a puzzle together. It's about watching a TV show together. It's about watching a new show on Netflix. It's finding the us, what I call the usness of our relationship, mm, right? Like who, who, are, who are we? What is the yeah. essence of our usness? And understanding that sometimes the usness will lead us to places that we never thought we'd go. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for instance, Kim loves to shop. Okay. Me she, too. She loves it. She, <laughs> I tell I tell everybody she has a black belt in shopping. <laughs> she's, she's just she's the best at it. So so I would never wake up on a Saturday. Okay. Yeah. I'd never wake up on a Saturday morning. Let's say it's a beautiful day. I'd never get in my car, yeah. drive to Charlottesville, park my car at Barracks Road. Yeah. And then spend four or five, six hours going in and out of shops. Yeah, Chris is not my husband's I, not doing that. I either. would never do that by myself. Yeah. But if I'm being truthful, you said, do you all enjoy doing that together? I would say we do. Okay. Because Kim's love language is quality time. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if I'm with her doing her favorite thing and I'm being there as her partner and I'm getting her a different, different color or a different size or whatever, then that's the usness of the relationship. Now she'll be generous and say things like, well, do you want to go over and watch a little bit of the game at the bar and get a beer and I'll meet you over there? And I'll be like, yep, sounds good. You know? so, so there that's is knowing your partner. Right. Exactly. And that's <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying. Like, is, yeah. is, is that being choosing to have that kind of vulnerability, mm-hmm. right. And learning what your partner loves and how to love them is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. The third one is affection. And I break that down um, into general affection which is like hand-holding, cuddles, hugs, things like that. And then our sex life, you know, how satisfied do I feel? How connected do I feel? How fed do I feel? Um, and the last one for some couples is a big deal. Others, it's not a big deal at all. And I just call that the spiritual one. Mm-hmm. Do, I spiel, do I feel spiritually safe with you? Can I share that part of my life with you? Um, do, I, do I feel like that we can share that life together? Mm-hmm. So that's the four pillars of the connection. And any, anybody can do that little assessment on your own with your partner. Thank you for sharing that with yeah, our for laughers. Sure. Anybody can do that. They yep. could spend the weekend doing that. And then if you get into a big conflict and you start spinning your reels, then that's maybe a sign that you need to talk to somebody else. Uh, right? Yes. And let's talk about safety about that. In this, in this program, when the heat is ramped up, uh-huh. uh, what advice can you give or is there part of that in this program where you say uh, we establish boundaries or a timeout, how would a couple start establishing yeah, a safety of, zone when communication isn't going to happen because the emotions are way high? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, yeah. One of, one of the things that I've, that I've done with couples over the years is to, to help them to develop a sign um, or a word mm. that they can say. Um, that says to the partner, we're dysregulated right now. Like, mm-hmm. like this is not going well and I'm getting, I'm getting too worked up or I'm getting too upset, or whatever it may be, or I'm so angry. I can't even think straight. Right. Now. Like, okay, those are all valid things that can happen. In we're argument, human. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But being able to agree upon like one couple I work with, um, they take their hand and they put it over their heart. Oh, that's okay. a nice gesture. Right? I like that. Um, one yeah. couple puts their hands together like in a prayer and they look down. Okay. It's almost like a submission. Not that you're wrong. Right. It's just submitting to, hey, this isn't working how we're doing it. 
We both see that. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's step away from that. Let's gain perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Let's use wise mind. Remember, mm-hmm. let's drop into wise mind and let's try to speak with words from wisdom, right? About what's the best way to move forward. Now, we also at times um, with the prep program, they, they, they taught what's called the um, having the floor. It's just a speaker listener technique. You know, mm-hmm. who's got, the, uh, who's got the, the rock or whatever you want to use. The, um, who's got the mic for yeah. something like today, right? Yeah. So what you ask the couple to do is you ask them to talk about something conflictual. Um, and I'll do this and I'll just let the couple go, right? And they'll, the prep approach uses an example of a young man and a young woman where um, they just start arguing about the television. And she says, why is it that every Saturday, Saturday night, all day, Sunday, Monday night, you get to watch television and and watch football? And he was like, well, you knew when you got together with me that I love football. I played football. I wanted I this was an important part of my life. You should have known that. And they just start arguing and Mm -hmm. they start bickering. Now, somebody might say, well, let's let's use problem solving. Right. Is there another TV in the house? And maybe we can make a chart. And then each of, you, each of you all can have equal time on the small TV and the big TV. What's the problem with that? It's not getting to the root of the problem. Correct. And now they're in separate rooms. Right. right? And the connection's lost. That then. is correct. So yeah. it's helping them. And so then we teach the technique, right? And when the, this was done in the prep video, then it teaches them that when you have the mic, when you have the floor, try to be as concise and to the point into the heart of the matter about what it is that you're thinking and what it is that you're feeling. Mm. Now, this young woman, she, she asked for the mic. She asked for the floor. And when, when they taught her the technique, all of a sudden she says, I guess it just seems like that when you're watching football that much, that that's something that's more important to you. Mm-hmm. Bam. There mm-hmm. it is. Right. And then mm-hmm. he was able to, to give back to her. He says, so you, so you're, you're worried that somehow football has become uh, a bigger deal to me than, than my connection to you. And she goes, yeah, yeah. And I think she gave two yes because it was, yeah, you got, you got my she, phrase right. And she was also to go, damn, that is what's going on. I don't feel as important to him. Yeah, right? She and identified I, it. Exactly. And yeah. thus, I don't feel as connected to you. And if I don't feel connected, then I'm not going to feel safe. And if we don't talk about it, then we start to drift. And then we start doing things like going to the separate bedroom to watch my show while he's downstairs watching his. Mm -hmm. And that's never going to get to the heart of the matter. And that turns into going off to different vacations and different trips without your partner. More than the boys trip. More, you know what I mean? Yes. Or the girls trip or, or whatever. Or, or worse. Friends trip. Or worse, trying to seek that, that comfort in someone else. Mm, you know, yeah. Nobody wants to talk about infidelity, but, you know, it's out there. And there's a lot of it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Which is why, you know, one of the phrases um, we use in the workshop is uh, it's when, when the grass looks greener on the other side, it's time to water your own. Right? Mm-hmm. That just means I need to work on me. We need to work on us because if we keep getting disappointment by our partner not showing up for us, Mm -hmm. it makes sense that I'm going to go somewhere else to find that, Mm -hmm. right? If I'm not getting it from my partner, which I should be, sooner or later, I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to drink from a a, a different well. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard so many. I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard, you know, one person in the couple dyad say, you know, I just feel like my cup is empty, right? And Mm -hmm. again, so sad, right? That doesn't mean you're doomed. It means we've got to find ways to fill that cup up, right? We may need some help. Or are there are other issues going on. Sure. Addiction. Oh, yeah. And all different forms. Mm-hmm. Alcohol, drugs. Trauma, sex addiction, trauma history. Trauma history. Mm-hmm. There's all lot. the above. Mm-hmm. Yep. Financial strain. Exactly. Children. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, I love my boys, but man, they weren't the best thing for my relationship when they were little. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like cramping that love right, style. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I forgive them for it, but, you know, but it's, but it is hard. There's a reason that, you know, research tells us that yeah. you know, most couples after the birth of a child report lower levels of marital satisfaction. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, who are the ones that aren't reporting that? Like, I, I, I want to talk to them. Same. Absolutely. Right. And there's so many factors that are involved yes. in that. Oh yeah. You know what? 
what was taught to you, the mm-hmm. value system that you grew mm-hmm. up with, the parenting style that you mm-hmm. were brought up with versus your partners yeah. and how conflicts were handled oh, yeah. and layers upon layers upon layers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's where the good yeah. stuff is, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where the good stuff is. It's yeah. just not always easy to get there. Yeah. Yeah. You got a lot of wonderful values that you put in your own services. Thank you. Yes. Which includes your emphasis in the power of hope, healing, and possibility. Yeah. How do you help the individuals navigate the challenging situations and find hope in times of the transition? Yeah. Um, I have to give Kim credit for the, the possibility thing. She, uh, as you know, she taught Spanish for years yes. at Harrisburg High School. She's yes. in a different role now. But when she was teaching Spanish, um, she had a like a banner in her room that said, dwell in possibility. And that was for the kids that were coming in going, I can't speak Spanish. I'm never going to be able to speak Spanish. And she was like, I'm not asking you to fully commit to it. Just dwell in the possibility that maybe you could if you really put your mind to it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I kind of take that same approach with my clients that, Oftentimes, as you can imagine, they will come in feeling fa- fairly hopeless, um, lacking a belief in themselves anymore. One of the things that I've mentioned to my clients over the years, I'll say, I mean, is it okay for me to believe in you until you're ready to believe in yourself? Mm-hmm. And they'll go, I guess, you know, but the number of times that I've had <laughs> yeah. clients come up later and then just say, thank you for believing in me when I wasn't ready to believe in myself. And I was like, you know, it was easy to do. You just couldn't see it yet. You had to, you had to get there. and so. I can't remember. I'm trying to remember the guy who made this quote. It said, you know, you've heard of dope dealers, you know, that therapists are hope dealers. Hope, like, dealers, hope dealers. Yeah. yeah. Like we I have to you have. said dope dealers for a minute. <laughs> right. <laughs> I wanted to clarify in case yes, somebody else please. was hearing that too. <laughs> please, please. But we live, um, I think, who was it? That had the quote that said, I'm a prisoner to hope, you know, mm. and that really resonated with me. Uh, I think it was Desmond Tutu, actually. Um, that I have to have hope in, in people's ability to heal, to evolve, to grow, or I couldn't do this work. You know, I, I, I don't, I, I just couldn't do it. And so having belief in somebody's ability to change, to evolve, to grow is a therapeutic intervention in and of itself. Right. Mm-hmm. Because oftentimes folks that come into this space um, have not had that kind of support. They haven't had, you know, someone who just intensely uh, listens to them and can hold hard things with them and accept them. That's the first thing that I say to my clients when they come in is that I said, you can't trust this now, but I hope you come to trust that I accept you as you are, who you are, how you are unconditionally. And you don't have to do anything more than be yourself, you know, and that is freeing for people. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about doing that within the couple, right? of allowing each person within the diet to feel truly that they can be themselves. Right. That's what the hope is for. Right. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get there sometimes. Okay. Especially (laughs) when you've had a lot of relational failure. Right. Or you've had infidelity. Um, You know, it's hard to go to that place of vulnerability. And I, and I recognize that. Mm. Yeah. And there's different transitions as you were mentioning and life. That can be very challenging. Absolutely. The new mom, new moms and dads, mm-hmm. new parents, if they're same sex. Yep. Uh, just uh, introducing mm-hmm. another young life into the home comes with a lot of responsibility. It's it sure very does. labor intensive early. Yes, it is. But every stage comes with a whole new set of challenges. Mm-hmm. And, and blessings. And, you know. Yeah. And all, yeah. all the things. Yeah. You just, but it, you know, good Good stress and bad stress is still stress. It is. Feels the same. It feels the same. And for those new parents out there Mm -hmm. going through a challenging situation where this is a whole new concept of it's not just me and you anymore. And we can just go to D.C. and Mm -hmm. go to the orchestra because we don't have the babysitter or the baby's not well enough, you know, for us to go out right now. Mm -hmm. How does... the new parents mm-hmm. deal with this challenging well, uh, transition. Yeah. I mean, I've said to many people, I don't, I don't know how people that don't have people that don't have community do it. Um, I feel so um, 
feel so bad and so sad for people that don't have extended family or extended community to, to help take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very lucky, um, when Kim's mom was still with us, um, before her passing, my parents are still with us, that they were very open that, you know, and if I, I could go and say, Hey, could you take the boys for the evening? Just so Kim and I can have a little time together. Mm -hmm. Right. And that could be just watching a movie or could be, you know, going out to dinner. Um, it could be going for a walk, whatever, whatever your thing is to connect, but, you know, trying to find uh, babysitters that are reliable, you mm -hmm. know, that's a, that's a tough thing for people, you know, and especially nowadays I've found people are less likely to trust, right. Mm. To trust somebody coming in their home, to take care of their kid. And I get it. I get it. But try to be creative and try to, again, make your relational bond. Okay. You had a relational bond before you had this baby. And the reason that this baby's here probably was probably because you had a good relational bond. Yeah. Or at least I hope so. So we have to remember to prioritize it. Right. And again, make it a priority and not a luxury. And make time for it. Make time for it. Got him. Okay. Is there a particular cadence that works out for that kind of situation? You know, you hear some people say, oh, you should have a date night a week or a date night every so often. Well, here, or, I'm all for the date night thing. Mm -hmm. I, I really am. Um, but here's the thing. If Kim and I go to the movies, mm -hmm. okay, how often are we talking during the movie? Not much. Not much. Okay. There's not, a, you know, I'm super affectionate. Um, if I hold her hand, then she, her hand will start sweating and she'll pull away. Right. That's okay. I get it. So we're not, how are we really connecting in that movie? We're, we're spending time together. That's good. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm happy for any time a couple can get away and spend time together. But what are, what is allowing you to truly feel connected going back to those pillars, right? Mm -hmm. Like how can I, what, what do I need from you in this space, in this moment, that's going to help me feel emotionally connected to you socially, intellectually, connected, physically, connected, spiritually. Connected. And, and, and again, being able to prioritize that, you know what, we, we have to do that. You know, we find time for everything. Mm -hmm. We find time to go to the gym. We find time to listen to a podcast. I thought that was funny. Laughers, <laughs> right? We have time to go to church. We have the time. The therapist to pick, is making jokes. <laughs> right. We have time to do all kinds of things, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but we, we tend to neglect something that's so important, like our marital or relational bond. And sometimes it's just making a commitment whether it's a commitment in this commitment in this new year that I'm really going to work on my relationship and try to make it the best relationship that I can. And if I don't have the skills or tools to do it, then I'm going to go find somebody that can help me do that. One of the things that I mentioned to people is, you know, I don't ever want you to see me on the street, come up to me and go, Hey, Randy, how are you and Kim? And I would have to look at you truthfully and go, you know, thanks, Don, we're, we're, we're fine. Or we're, we're okay. Now, have there been times in our relationship that Kim and I are just fine or that we're okay? Yes. Yes. We've had challenges just like everybody else. But by and large, I want to be able to look at you truthfully and say, you know what? We're doing good. Thanks for asking. Or we're doing great. You know, how are you guys doing? Right. Mm -hmm. And if we are just fine or we're just okay, then that's a trigger. You know, mm -hmm. how, what is it that we need to do? to make sure that we're moving those obstacles that are keeping us from feeling good to great. I like that. And you mentioned too, that you're a child of God. Faith mm -hmm. is a big part of your life. It is. How does that intersect with your therapeutic approach? It's a great question. Um, you know, people will ask me, you know, are you a Christian counselor? That kind of mm -hmm. thing. And I'll say, no, I'm a counselor who's Christian. Um, you know, my faith background um, informs, uh, the work that I do. Um, but I, I'm very, very, very careful, um, that, that my belief system, I don't use my chair as a pulpit. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not, I'm not here to preach to people. I'm not here to convert. People. That's not what your faith informing your work. That's, that's not what that's about. Um, does it affect the way that I prepare myself? Yeah. You know, I'll pray, uh, to be grounded, I'll pray to open my ears and open my heart to receive my clients as they are unconditionally. And here's the other thing I want to state this clearly. I don't care whether you're atheist, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, gay, straight, trans, whatever. Okay. I accept all comers. Okay. I think God is love. Right. And that's what I hope to emulate to people and to accept them with that very broad God is love. Kind 
Now that'll make some people upset. Okay. And I understand that, but I, you know, I come from a perspective that in my experience, that if we can get to a place to accept each other unconditionally, then mm-hmm. that's where real good can be done. I don't care what your background is. I think we can all agree that um, loving each other is a good start. Mm-hmm. So maybe we should start there. I think that is the basic. Right. Uh, basic human connection. Yes. Is through love. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And understanding people all come from different perspectives yes. and experiences yes. that draw them to where they are in the moment mm-hmm. because we're changing every day. All the time. You know? can't stop it. No, for better, for worse. Right. Yeah. And so change. I'm going to just start by accepting you as, yeah. as, as you are. Right? Yeah. And not to say that any of those things are better for worse. Just right. as exactly. an individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and the meter is ourselves. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I tell, you know, I, I give a phrase that, that I'll say oftentimes when I hear my clients say, you know, they'll say I'm stuck or I feel stuck. Yeah. Or the couple will say we're stuck or, or they'll say, you know, we're right back at square one. And I'll go, no, 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 no. You're at square one once. Okay. Right. Because if we're back at square one, that negates all the hard work you've been doing. Okay. You had a bad day. You had a bad night. Let's get back to the principles of what made you. Uh, get here and work on your relationship. today. But for people that say that they're stuck, um, the phrase that I love so much is everything is on its way to somewhere all the time and mm-hmm. we can't stop. it. Mm-hmm. Right. It's that concept that we're all moving towards something. That we're all growing. I mean, think about it. Our, our brains are growing and changing right now. Mm-hmm. Our hearts are growing and changing right now. All aspects of us are changing. So sometimes we may feel stuck, but we aren't really. And so that's just, you know, that's a classic like social work reframe, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, hey, how can we look at this in a different way? Going back to what you said before, that now we're looking at it with possibility. Mm -hmm. That we're looking at it with hope. That we're not stuck, but we feel stuck and we acknowledge that. And what are the things that are going to help us to not feel so stuck? Mm. That's all information Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. help guide us. Absolutely. To healing and hope. And, yeah. you know, sometimes people say, you know, how do I get my partner to, to come? And I'll say, don't call it therapy. Don't, you don't have to call it counseling. Call it, you know, relational enhancement. <laughs> call it, you know, call it relationship education. Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. Yeah. Right. We're sharing information. We're sharing what researchers, we're sharing what different theories say that can help you to have a better relationship. And if a partner says, no, I'm not willing to do that then you might have bigger fish to fry Mm -hmm. because that's saying I'm unwilling to grow, right? Or Mm -hmm. I'm unwilling to be vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. That's a tough sell. And a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll ask to speak with the reluctant partner on the phone. And if we can have that, that gentle conversation where I can destigmatize what it means to go and get help from somebody, Mm -hmm. usually they'll give it a shot. And as I've said to people too, but if you come and meet with me, and you think I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm talking about. And, and, and the beard's too much. Right. And the beard's too much. <laughs> right. Then don't come back. Uh, yeah. Don't come back. You yeah. know, find somebody that's going to fit for you. But the hope is that, yeah, the space is going to, I'm going to find the space to be, to be warm, to be accepting, to be inviting, and to be hopeful. What I find refreshing about your approach from what I'm hearing is you, you're, you're not afraid to get in there. No, I'm not. Which, is really wonderful because well, yes, you're welcome because I've, I've been on the journey. You mm-hmm. get, there are therapists out there and I'm not, and maybe you can speak on why this is, mm-hmm. but you go, you can go in there and they, they're just listening for the hour. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you leave Yeah, or you get, you can have a therapy experience where you're sharing and you get, well, what I hear you saying is, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And basically repeating back to you. Yeah, just We call it parroting. Right. Yeah, just being a parrot. And so with, yeah, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, so it's not a surprise people have been following the podcast, but I have a trauma history. It's pretty significant. Okay. And so I have what they call complex PTSD. Yes, ma'am. Uh, with some dissociation that I now know how to manage. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I went to some, either one of those types of therapists. Sure. I, I would be there for how many more years mm-hmm. with no help 
You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. That, I'm just, that it just feels like I'm just spinning my wheels. Right. That I'm not really getting anywhere. Right. That I'm not getting to the root. That's right. Or the cause. Absolutely. And I didn't know that's what I had. Yeah. But I knew that it was a bunch of stuff. Yeah. That if I went to either of those therapeutic approaches, mm-hmm. I could still be this in the same place. Sure. And, in my late eighties, sure, to be honest right, with you. Right. So how, what are, what are your thoughts on that? And I mean, there's, there's, there's all different modalities of therapy. Some are, yeah. some are more directive, some are less directive. Some, mm-hmm. um, you know, some people, um, just feel more comfortable. And I have these clients too, that will, you know, come in my office and yeah. they'll sit down and they'll just, They'll just talk, 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 talk. And that's what they want to do. Yeah, that's healing. Yeah, for yes. Them. Yes. And, and, okay, and I listen. So pay and, attention to yeah, yourself. And you what have you to, need. yeah, you, you have okay. to pay attention to the needs of the client in mm-hmm. the space, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not me um, changing who I am. It's me molding how I, I do the work that I do, depending on the need of the client. Okay. Okay. So a client who has a trauma history is, it's going to take a while to establish trust. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. A long time, perhaps, to establish trust, Mm -hmm. a long time to get to that place where where they can share openly that emotion. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this with the experiences. Yes. Yeah. And with dissociation, I mean, that dissociation is built to what? To protect you. Yeah. You know, to keep you protected, to to not re-traumatize. Right. And so that's the first rule of anything. It's like, don't re-traumatize. Yeah. Be with the client where they are. You know, focus on, you know. Sometimes in therapy, I'll just simply look at my clients. Sometimes they'll, they'll talk about something that's really bad. And I'll say, you know, it really sucks. And they'll go, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it just sucks. And Mm -hmm. I hate that you're going through it, Mm -hmm. but let's get in there. Let's talk about it. Right. So therapy doesn't have to be complex. I mean, I want, I want you to be trained. Absolutely. (laughs) Um, But sometimes it's just being present to that individual. And Mm -hmm. we know this from research too. It's not, it's not the modality that brings people back. Really? It's, it's the relationship. It's, mm-hmm. it's that I feel safe there. I feel heard there. I feel understood. I feel like ultimately I can be myself. Mm-hmm. And if you can't feel that in any relationship, mm-hmm. think about getting out of it. Mm. And that's even with a therapist. You know, you should feel safe. You should feel connected. You should feel heard. You should feel understood. And maybe... I'm trying to be open to everything. Right. So maybe that's the purpose and parrot, parrot therapy. I think you called it. Mm-hmm. Like when you repeat it back. Right. Maybe there are people that need to need that type of therapy to feel heard for the, for finally or yeah. the first time or. But, but yeah. And I think, and I think what I hear from clients often mm-hmm. that, that go, that have been with other therapists is that they'll hear the words, but they don't feel it. Right. That they mm-hmm. don't, they don't, I didn't feel like they really, really wanted to know me, that they really connected with me. Again, it, it all relationships, connection. You know, if, you, they, if they don't feel a connection with you, it's going to be hard to get them to do hard work. Because mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? If I don't feel safe and I don't feel understood and I don't feel accepted for who I am, I'm not going to go to those vulnerable places. Mm-hmm. Yes. As, this, as someone who has trauma history, and I know there are laughers out there because we all have Absolutely. some degree of, of that. Yes. And we all, yes. we all do for sure going through the COVID mm-hmm. pandemic together. Mm-hmm. Anyway, when you do have a significant trauma history, the biggest fear that you have mm-hmm. about calling the therapist and getting in that room mm-hmm. is you fear touching mm-hmm. those experiences, those experiences says that mm-hmm. vulnerability yeah. because it hurts so much the first time mm-hmm. you don't want to go there again. You don't think you can handle it. Mm-hmm. You don't think that you're going to be strong enough to handle it. Yeah. And as someone who's gone through the experience or I can call it a journey. So mm-hmm. I, Good. I'm going to be like continuing and can continuing yeah. to discover more of myself Life and get deeper. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And get deeper and continue down the healing path mm-hmm. as I learned, and I learned this in reading first and then all couples with therapy, that because of our fantastic neuroplasticity of our brain, mm-hmm. it, when you decide to do the work mm-hmm. and, and your therapist will guide you through and pace with you, mm-hmm. um, 
you can heal a lot faster yeah, create than new pathways. new pathways that you will be surprised are shorter mm-hmm. than the pain has lasted mm-hmm. for however many months or years because yeah. of the fear yeah. to do the work to heal from it. And, and one can so, empathically yeah. understand why that's so scary, mm-hmm. you know, but we, our tendency, you know, with trauma is we want to compartmentalize it. Mm-hmm. Right. And a lot of times what I see is that we get out of touch with that part of ourselves, ourselves. Um, if I'm, if I'm doing trauma work with somebody and talking about, let's say childhood trauma, mm-hmm. um, one of the exercises that I do with them is just basic inner child work. Right. Mm-hmm. Is that I'll ask them to think about when the trauma or when the abuse what is, was at its worst. And can, mm-hmm. can you picture yourself at that time, at that age? And then they'll usually say yes. And they'll say, you know, maybe I was eight years old when my dad was abusing me. Was. And I'll say, so I want you to think about that you now, whatever age you are, with all your life experience, um, uh, imagine being able to go back to that self, back to little Randy, and imagine going into his room and sitting on his bed. And what does little Randy need? Mm-hmm. Right. What, yeah. I've what been is, through that exercise. It's exactly. very powerful. It's incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing that I say, so you, you, you hug the child, you tell the child everything that they needed to hear. Um, you let them say if they need to say anything or cry or whatever, if they need a hug, whatever and that may be. And then at the end, I ask them, I'll say, then, then I want you to stand up. And as you're leaving the room, I want you to reach for your little self. <laughs> and I want yeah. you to say, it's time to come home. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. imagine bringing that part of you, that wounded part of you, home to a place where that part of you will forever have a voice and, yes. and will forever have a place and, and will finally be safe. Right. Yeah. Right. It, it seems so simplistic. Yeah. But in the moment and when people really embrace that, you know, it can be really, really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And for those laughers who have not decided to take that plunge yet, I just want to testify. It's worth it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it really is. Just take it one day at a time, Absolutely. one moment at a time and and find someone that you have a fit with and they'll guide you through that process. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, how do you balance passion for sports, golf and family on a lighter note with the <laughs> demands of your profession? Right, right. Well, again, I've got, a, I've got an awesome wife. Um, uh, I have great kids. Uh, I've got a good family good friends, you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's, that's just kind of my escape, you know, ah, there you go. it's just, it's my way of getting away and, and putting work away and just being, being focused on that. I, I you know, if, my mother said to me one time, she, uh, I was cheering for one of Sawyer's games and I was like yelling my head off and losing my mind at the referee or something. Like that. My mom looks over and she's like, she's like, what if your clients could see you behaving like this? And I said, I really don't care. You know, I'm just, I'm just in it, you know? So those things are just there are things that help me to distract, um, help me to put the work down a little bit. Um, I teach a class, you know, uh, over at JMU, and I, I tell my students there that I get filled up by doing that. Um, Gives you joy. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. Being around young people that are really passionate about getting into this field um, and humbly being able to share, you know, wisdom and information about how to get there. Um, that just that feeds my soul, and so. For anybody in any profession, you, know, you have to have your outlets to, to feed yourself, to feed your soul. Um, I'm not always the best at it. Okay. I'm just, <laughs> you know, I'm just like anybody else. I mean, yeah. I will. You mean get, the work-life balance right, situation? You know, absolutely. Sometimes I need to practice what I preach. Let's just say that. Yeah. Right? Kim reminds me all the time. <laughs> I have to constantly do that. Be present, Don. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So imperative on your, uh, Oh, this is another question before I get to that one. Can you share a memorable success story where you witnessed significant positive transformation in an individual or couple's life? Wow. I know you probably have a few. Yeah. Um, I think probably my favorite, um, would be a client that I worked with, um, a long time ago. Um, with, we'll just call it significant trauma. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be specific at all, but significant trauma. And we worked together for several years 
Um, and I remember this person looking at me saying, um, you know, or I'm paraphrasing a little, um, that there's never a day that goes by that I don't feel dirty or defiled. Mm. And if somebody knew what I had been through, I don't know that. they mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. We did really hard, hard, hard work together. And this individual uh, eventually moved away. Um, but they gave me a call and left it a voicemail. This is when I was working at RMH and the voicemail basically said, Randy, you, you, you held out hope that one day I would find somebody that would love me for me. And I just wanted to call and tell you that I found that person no. and I'm on the way to get married right now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I just, I just, what? and I, and, I, and it, the person said in the call, I, I don't know if you will remember me. And I'm like, of course I'm going to remember this person, you know? Yeah. And I just, I just talk about crying. I just burst into tears oh, and that's beautiful. just, yeah, just to, and that's, what's so beautiful about this profession. You know, is it hard on the daily and hearing a lot about pain and suffering? Yeah, of course yeah. it is. But also watching people just so resilient, you know, and so determined mm-hmm. to to work through it and to get to that place is, again, it, just, it inspires me. You know, mm-hmm. um, I have one client that um, I've told them, I was like, you know, you're a walking miracle, you know, and I'm not going to stop telling you that. I mean, you just are a miracle that you're here and that you're working so hard after what I know that you've been through, you know, mm-hmm. let's keep up the good work. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. That too, right there is very key. You got to do the work. Yes. Yes. But it's not work, easy. It's not. No. But the beautiful thing about it is you will, I can also testify, feel a lot better. Yeah. I've mentioned, I've never, and maybe it's just because, I've never experienced, I don't know, but I've never Mm -hmm. had a client who's done the good hard work, come back and say, I wish I wouldn't have done that. Exactly. Right. Now I've heard him say that was the hardest damn thing I've ever done in my life. Right. And I thought I was going to die and I was ready to kill you as my therapist (laughs) because you walked me into this. You know, I've had those discussions, right? but never somebody saying, I wish I would. They'll say, I don't ever want to do that again. Yeah. Right. I hope I never have to go through something that was that was so difficult. Well, of course, of course, but they did it. Right. Yeah. And that's the choice right there. Right. Yes. So you can do, you can choose mm-hmm. to not address it. Yep. That is a choice. And when that happens, you're still carrying it. Mm-hmm. It's not integrated. Right. It's that baggage that we and, talked about. And it, it can, the harmful effects of that can manifest itself in relationship choices, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, staying in relationships, maybe that you are shouldn't. unhealthy. That's right. Right. And many other, you know, substance abuse, absolutely overworking, exactly overeating. Yeah. Not eating at all. Right? Perfectionism. Yep. Yep. Overthinking. Yep. You know, lots of, or, mm-hmm. or you can choose door number two. Right. And you can open that door and open your heart to the possibility yes. of hope and healing yes. and give yourself a lot of grace and compassion on, along the way. And I'm glad that you said that because it, it, yeah. it, 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 is, it is absolutely critical that you're encouraging people to uh, personal grace, to personal compassion, mm-hmm. um, to be able to understand that they're just, they're just a human being, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, who's just trying to figure it out. And some of some of us have had more challenges than others, and that's not the point, right? Mm-hmm. It's your 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 struggle is your struggle. Absolutely, own it, own it, work on it, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, don't apologize for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't don't think you have to have it all figured out because none of us do. <laughs> no, you know, none of <laughs> no. us do. We're just trying to figure it out too. But mm-hmm. to extend that personal grace and and personal compassion is so critical. Yeah. And, and one of the first things I learned was key mm. in the healing journey is self-love, mm. self-love, self-love to mm-hmm. go along with that grace and compassion. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, and that can be a lot, it can look a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, some people taking a hot bath is, mm-hmm. is self-love. Some people taking a hike is self-love. Absolutely. Some people like both. Yeah. <laughs> you know Take the hike, then go back for a bath. That's right. You know, it can right. be a night out with your girlfriends at mm-hmm. the winery, or it could be, you know, sure. reading a, your favorite book or picking up a new one or mm-hmm. learning something new. 
The point is to love you. Yes. And, yeah. And yeah. making those connections, right? Yeah. You know, with yourself. Yes. Yes. Connecting with nature on the hike. Yeah. You know, connecting with your body in the tub. You know, connecting yeah. with your gr- girlfriends at the winery. Yeah. Again, connection. Connection. It all comes back to it. It really does. And on your website, I must, that's where I was going to get to. So mm-hmm. we, can, we must. Okay. The website, you have a quote about you. On your website, Randy is a born to do this kind of therapist. Mm -hmm. I've seen him transform the lives of countless individuals and couples, all with a heart of service, humility, and unconditional compassion. What values would you say you bring to your practice other than the healing, hope, and possibility Mm. um, that shape your interaction with your clients? I think it goes back to what I said before, just um, what I would call radical acceptance. uh, uh, you know, Carl Rogers, you know, you probably, a lot of laughers probably heard of him in college, you know, taking psychology courses. Um, but he talked about, you know, unconditional positive regard, right? It's, it's accepting the actor without necessarily accepting the act. Okay. That's so important. Yes. Please and talk that, about that. And that can be really, really hard. It can be. Yes. Okay. I used to, I used to work, uh, help to run a developer. A domestic violence program, mm. doing group therapy for individuals who have been convicted of a domestic assault and battery on a partner or even a child. Okay. Mm. It was hard at times to have compassion when you're dealing with somebody who's violent. Okay. Mm-hmm. But what I found, there were two things that were, that were really interesting to me is that I would, my friends, if we we're going out and drinking a beer or playing golf or whatever, back then, you know, one guy said, what's it like to to deal with a bunch of wife beaters. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I said, it's actually, that's not what I'm experiencing. What I'm experiencing for most of these guys, and they were mostly males, is that they've never been able to truly understand what it is they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently, how do I express that in a way that feels safe? Right? So you're dealing with a lot of guys that don't know how to recognize what they're feeling, Mm -hmm. what they're going through, you know, and then not knowing how to express it. And so then we just get, then we're feeling those secondary emotions, which is like anger, frustration, getting pissed off when we need to get to the primary emotion, which is hurt, mm-hmm. disappointment, fear, embarrassment, things like that. Um, but, but being able to challenge yourself, my job as a therapist, as a counselor is, t- is to accept you where you are, period. Okay. I might not, I'm. You know, I've had somebody say, have you liked every client that you work with? Well, of course not. You know, we can't like everybody we come into contact, but I'm going to accept that person for who they are, where they are, how they are, and what their goals are in counseling. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to judge. Mm -hmm. And I try very hard not to, right? I try very, very hard to, I'm not, I'm not their judge. I'm not their dad, right? Mm -hmm. I'm who they come to, to feel safe again, and to express themselves in vulnerability and in fear. Mm. You touched on something else I think is really important in the healing journey. Mm. What's that? And that's identifying your feelings. Oh my gosh, yes. A lot of us, I mean, there's a plethora. I mean, there are Mm -hmm. so many feelings. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to acknowledge them and identify them so that we can process them. They can pass through Mm -hmm. and we can integrate our experiences Mm -hmm. into our whole self. Absolutely. For the healing. One of the things we got in uh, couples therapy, Chris and I did is emotion wheel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so yeah. that was very powerful too. Good. And going through that process of identifying them now helps us communicate now when, when it's not about the cornbread. <laughs> right, it's not, right. It's not about the cornbread. Right. <laughs> yeah. You made me think of the, the when you're talking about the different layers, and uh, I remember one guy who came through uh, the, the the domestic violence program who um, who was a young man, um, and he was convicted. Um, he hit his partner. Mm. Um, his his partner was accusing him of things, right, um, that he wasn't doing. He says, and so when I asked him, so just real quick, I asked him, I said, "What were you feeling the night of the incident?" Mm-hmm. And He said he was feeling angry. And I said, was there anything else that was going on for you? He was like, I was pissed off. I said, anything, anything else that you can touch on? And he said something. I was mad. I said, so you were angry, you were mad, you were pissed off. I said, anything else? And he goes, I don't know. What do you want from me? 
And so I said, okay. I said, work with me for a second. I said, if we can assume that there was a mask that you were wearing, and that mask was anger, pissed off, and being mad. If we remove that mask, what emotion might be behind it? Mm. And he's slow. He's not looking at me. And then all of a sudden he just goes, hurt. And I said, how many times have you expressed that hurt with your partner? And never, Mm. never. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. Being able to get to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that this was very hurtful to him. I'm not excusing what he Mm -hmm. did. Okay. At all. At all. I mean, it's inexcusable, but for him to change, He's got to be able to get to, again, that vulnerable place where he needs to do his own healing mm-hmm. so that he doesn't act out in ways that are so harmful to the world. Mm. There's a great book out there for people that might want to figure out why someone's been abusive to them mm-hmm. or there's still some hope to mm-hmm. and some safety left to yeah. restore a relationship where there's some abuse going on. Yeah. Uh, It's called, Why Does He Do That? Yes, I have heard of that. I haven't read it, but I've heard of it. Yeah, so I would recommend that. I will check it out for sure. For people that might be going through that. There's resources in there if you're in that situation Mm -hmm. as well to call and get help. Yes. Yeah, which is also highly important. And I highly recommend if that's your situation to call and get help. Please do. Yeah. In your spare time, speaking of books... You enjoy reading. Are there any books or resources that you have gr- that have greatly influenced your approach to counseling and therapy? Yeah, I mean, I think for today's uh, conversation, it would probably be starting with a book like "Hold Me Tight" by Dr. Sue Johnson. Oh, um, it's con- it's seven conversations for a lifetime of love. Okay, um, and it looks at looks through an attachment lens, um, and I use it with my couples. Um, and that, that would be a really good starting place to just kind of learn about your own. She calls it your dance, like learning what our different dances are with our partners. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can just give you some insight in how to do dance with your partners, Mm -hmm. not literal dancing. No, no, no. Just metaphorical. Okay. Right. But Uh. if you want to dance, help yourself. (laughs) Did you hear that, Chris? (laughs) Right. I like that. Dance what, with your partner. Dance with your partner. I like that. I'm going to, I'm going to read that. Yeah. So thank you for that. Of course. What advice, uh, before we ask, uh, wrap this up here, what advice would you give to individuals or couples seeking to enhance their relationships or overcome challenges? Um, seek help. Yeah. Uh, look for, talk to people about um, local, uh, wherever you are, laughers, um, find resources about, who's a, a good couples therapist or couples counselor, um, look and see, um, if there are, um, uh, re- retreats or workshops that you can do. I, you know, I, I've done that before, um, for churches where I'll go in and spend a weekend. I used to do that. I used to do a thing at the hospital where couples would come and spend the weekend, which was just so much fun. Um, and I'm not, I'm being dead serious about that. It's probably my favorite thing to do. Um, and, 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 and again, it's, it's having the courage to go, we need help, like mm-hmm. coming full circle. We don't know what we don't know. So let's have the courage to get out there and see what resources are in my community that I can use to have the best relationship that I can possibly have so that I can make sure that we're constantly working to get not from okay, mm-hmm. not to stay at okay, but to get to good or great. Mm, I like that because... That's, that's key. Mm -hmm. Finding the help. You may be in a relationship where you feel like you're going through the same Mm -hmm. thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that would be a pattern. You're stuck in a pattern. Yes. And if you're stuck in a pattern and you Mm -hmm. feel like this is is the same thing, it's just next year. It's the same thing. It's just next week. Right. That's where your therapist. Rinse and repeat. Yep. The rinse and repeat. If you want to stop the rinse and repeat. Right. And out a third party voice mm-hmm. that's skilled and trained with expertise yes. can help get to the heart of the matter and stop the pattern. Well said. Yeah. Great. I think we did great. How do you feel about it? I think it was good. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had fun. Good. Well, as we wrap up here, I think it's best to let the laughers know how they can stay updated with you on 
you have any social media or your website? How can they get in touch with you? If you would have said, well, when Kim hears that, she's going to laugh when she talks about me and social media. <laughs> and yes. I, if, if there's a computer near me, something's going to go wrong. So <laughs> I'm not on Instagram or anything like that, but you can, mm-hmm. you can reach me at my website. Um, if you just, if you actually, if you just Google Randy hook, it'll take you directly to my website, contact me through there. And if I could help in any way to get you two resources or help you myself, I'm more than happy to do so. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Randy. This has been super delightful and very encouraging to chat with you on all things hope, healing, and possibility. Thank you for sharing some of your story stories and services that you provide to help people build and restore meaningful relationships. Thanks again for coming on the show. It's been my pleasure. Thanks, Dawn. You bet. And laughers, to learn more about what Randy has to offer you, be sure to visit his webpage at randyhooklcsw.com. That's randyhooklcsw.com and click get started now. Also, don't forget that discount on Prepopsterous using promo code LAUGH15 at prepopsterous.com. That's P-R-E-P-O-P-S-T-E-R-O-U-S.com. That way you can munch on it when you join me on next week's episode. And lastly, and most importantly, thanks for tuning in, laughers. Out of all the podcasts out there, you picked us, and we think that's pretty darn special, just like you. Until next time, keep smiling. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. We'll be dropping a new podcast every Wednesday. So check back for another uplifting episode. Come to an X2 Comedy show or let us bring one to you. To find out more, head to X2Comedy.com. Be sure to share this podcast with a friend. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.